Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings. Final day, one day to go, Players Championship, final bets, DraftKings picks, preview and ownership, plus the one and done and the weather. And we have $500 to give away and maybe another $500 to give away. In fact, we do have another $500 to give away to you, the good people out there. So reminder to smash the like, give me your favorite DraftKings play down in the description and sub to Mayo Media Network. Tambo is in the studio with me. You were generous enough to say, hey, Pat, you're putting up 500 bucks. I'll put up 500 bucks too. Double down. I like it. Big week last week. Got to come off that just showdown shipper. Had the, the other NBA seat, but the showdown shipper, especially on the Mail Media Network, was nice to have that. Um, those round twos, man, they've been good to me playing that sort of weather angle. I had a couple afternoon guys talked about the groups and things like that on the show that we would do it that way, and it ended up working out in the end. So it was solid. Well, at Pazman99 is the winner of the $500 giveaway. I get in touch with you, I get you your 500 bucks. Congratulations on that. So now there is a separate giveaway for $500. You wanna give it out on this show next week? That's a great idea. After you get back from winning like $3 million at the NBA Live Finals? It's funny, that's pretty much the day. I'm back on Wednesday, so I'll be in the studio for this and then Thursday leave for Nashville. So yeah, we will give it away next Wednesday on this show. All right, so, so what you gotta do, there are two ways to enter, actually three ways to enter. If you retweet this show, you get a ballot into the draw. When it comes out on Twitter, you can share it on Facebook, wherever socials you can share it. Please go share it there. That gets you one ballot. You want to get five ballots into the draw? Follow at Toe, Tag, and Tambo on Twitter. You can find all of this in the newsletter as well, where all the final cheat sheets and all the extra info are going to be. Find that down in the description, completely free to join. But five ballots for at Toe, Tag, and Tambo on Twitter. And then 10 ballots, the regular stuff. Apple, rating and review, podcast for Spotify as well, rating and review, five stars, something nice, Twitter handle or email, sub to it while you're there as well. Download it too so we can boost those numbers up and you're in the draw for 500 bucks. If you've done any of this stuff throughout the course of the week, you are still in that draw, but I would recommend following you on Twitter because you got the tidbits already out. Yeah, maybe a couple extra ballots if you retweet the tidbits too today. Oh, yeah. like double down, go. right? Well, I'll throw that in as well because love that. Appreciate all the support with that every week and love doing it. So yeah, this is a good good giveaway. Another 500 bucks. We'll get it out there next week to you guys. Okay, so let's get into the bets for the week. <laughs> Tell me about all your closing line value, Pat. I actually don't really have any. Okay. <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> what do you got? I, I didn't bet Keegan. I didn't bet Cantley, and I didn't bet Day, so... There's only so much closing. I mean, I guess I have closing line value on Siwoo. Yeah. He's down to like 50 to 1 at this point. <laughs> but I was going to bet him either way at this tournament, like I do every single year. Uh, I have Homa at 25 to 1. Morikawa at 33 to 1. Tom Kim at 50 to 1. See, woo, Kim with eight places at 75 to 1. And then I went with Webb Simpson and Ben Griffin, 200 to 1, 250 to 1, all with the eight places. Those are essentially top 10 bets. With the added upside, if they win, that's fantastic news. Yeah. I lose the two points on the top 10 because it's going to be top eight, but I like quadruple my odds on the top 10. So yeah. that's, that's the best way. That's mainly the reason that I played that. If you have sites with each ways, I'd highly recommend that you do that. I broke it down a little bit with Pizzol and Cam on the best bet show yesterday. Did you happen to see that? I didn't see it yet. I'm behind done shows this week oh no yeah i, I gotta catch up i always catch all i missed last night with you and brian i want to watch that one you, as well. you, i mean it just it just turned into me like roasting brian that's right. the best that's why it's a good <laughs> shit he, he's great and that show is great so i, I love that one too but I'll, I'll catch up on all the shows so far i've just got through you feinberg cussed going through it on there and, and from there i've missed a few others do you agree with cuss that you too should be triggered about mcdonald's chicken big Macs. <laughs> i i think i'm on the worst angle i agreed with him more on the pga stuff of the no cuts because it's only like eight events in the end and people freaked out about nothing because i, I just don't care but uh, i i love it i love the cut sweat I, you know he he kind of had some angles and then i realized when i'm on him his side maybe i'm the one that's wrong here that is always the best way to look at it when you're uh, we're doing a show with cuss tonight for release tomorrow me gary and cuss mm -hmm. we need to get his aaron Rodgers takes on the record right Cousins now. Cousins versus Rodgers. Cousins versus Rodgers. Well, he's all, he said that if the Jets get Rodgers, that it's a 51% chance they win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Well, he knows the odds. Remember last year he was booking his tickets. That's true. After like Super week Bowl two. Super Bowl tickets for, yeah, week three or whatever it was. He said he's, he's out. So I don't know. It didn't end up too well. I decided to re-enter the first round leader market this week. Oh, just, God. I, I, just, I just want some action here. There's actually one that I really like and the rest of them are just like for fun in case it happens. Chris Kirk, 70 to one to be first round leader. I really like. 
Okay. That, doesn't he seem like the perfect guy to be leading the players after day one? You know, the two top threes earlier this year, the win in Florida. He actually played pretty well last week, too. But it's a shorter course. This is more of the style that we expect from Chris Kirk. I don't think he's going to hang on to win the entire tournament. But to be first-round leader, 70-1, to one, I love it. Definitely possible. Feels more like Keegan Bradley is going to do it again because all the conversation around him this week of how he's in he's in the zone. He got every club in his bag dialed, but he's super high owned. So it's probably a day one thing, and then we monitor full Keegan. But we'll see. His odds are probably pretty light. What did I? I played a to miss the cut parlay. Oh, on I Kirk, love those on here. Kirshner's show last night, and it was just the three the three guys that I mentioned off the top of the show. Like everyone's in on them. How could they fail? Can't let Keegan Day all three parlayed to miss the cut pays thirty seven to one. Lock it in. I already did. No, I, one, I, of, one of them is going to come through and just finish like 40th. That's sure. what's going to happen. But yeah, I, I like those bets, especially here. Again, the variance is so high. Everyone's talked about it all week. We know it. But just in general, that's the spot to do it if you're going to do it is here. So Kirk at 70, Henley and Webb at 80 to 1, Vegas at 100 to 1, Griffin and new dad, Ben Ann at 125 mm-hmm. to 1. He withdrew last week with a wrist injury, as it turned out. He had a kid. Yeah. That's why he, he did. Was, yeah, ben, ben no, I know his wife. Did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know you got to put in work in that in that oper- in the operating room there. So maybe he's uh, he's a little sore wrist from that. I don't know. Yeah, so that was the end of him. I had he sunk some nice DraftKings lineups that I had. I don't know if he was going to make the cut or not, but I did not realize that he was about to have a baby, so I inserted him into a lineup. Kenya, the Magic Kenya Open, Connor Syme, fifty to one, and then the two that we talked about on the show yesterday: Tommy Valiant, two hundred and fifty to one, with five places, and then. Nagorj Nagongu Kabugu, the Kabugi man, as Paul has aptly named him, 1,500 to 1 mm-hmm. with five places, and then Valiant and the Kabugi man, first round leader, 110 to 1, and 600 to 1 also with the top five. Then I played a top 40 on the Kabugi man at 7 to 1. I'm going with Homa as my one and done. Jeff is going with Patrick Cantlay, and Cust has taken Rory McElroy as his one and done. That sounds about right. That's the betting cheat sheet. For the week. Yeah, every, everybody wanted the, the magical Kenya Open bet, so I'm glad you brought it up again. I had people even DMing me like, do you know, can you ask Pat to repeat it they, again? They, they could have watched the show. I said, that's what I said. Go watch the show. Everything's on there. You can check it out. So, the, you know, not too many guys at 1,500 to 1 that you're going to be talking about this week in other places. So go check it out and get the pick. And it's nice that we can talk about it now before it's completely dead like three holes in. Yeah, but that's why you got the first round leader, just in case. That'd be amazing. 600 to 1? Just needs one good round. Hey, he, he, I believe he had the best round at this tournament in round two last year. Oh. So it's possible. Can we get a round two leaders it's, it's bet? possible. Well, let me just translate that into week or into round one this year, and I think we're going to be good to go. The weather. I'm looking at the super forecast right now on windfinder.com, <laughs> Ponte Verde Beach, and Viano slash Viano. The anniversary. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> of nailing it and then not nailing it. Yes, correct. Uh, Thursday looks fine. Like, you're going to get gusts up to, like, 14, average around 12. That's to be yeah. expected with Florida golf. Like, it's not no wind, but it's... And the temps are a little bit light. Like, it's, you know, on, on uh, Friday, it gets a lot hotter versus Thursday. It's pretty cold. Yes, but I mean... For there, for cold. Florida. Yeah. For Florida. 64, 66, high of 66 on Thursday. Uh, Friday, lighter in the morning on average with, like, 7, 8 mile per hour winds and like with highs of like 73 in the morning and then in the afternoon you have up to 12 13 but gusts up to 20 so if you did want to play a p.m a.m stack i think that'd be the only one that i would go to here i mean you can always stack both sides no matter what you just like stacking waves anyway yeah i don't think it's necessary this week yeah, I'm, I'm not doing this, but if you want to run back last season and just jam all PM AM and just hope that it works this time, like I was a year behind, like just do it that way. You could do that. But I, I always like PMA. I, someone asked me about this this week, I, you know, talking about strategy and been doing more of that lately, helping people out. And they asked me all these strategy questions and stuff. And I brought it up. They said, you know, why do you like stacking anyway? And I said, the reason I sometimes stack anyway with like a PM AM. So last week, I'll give you a, a quick example. Last week, everyone said, oh, the weather waves didn't work because the leaderboard was littered with both sides. That's true. But you can't really say that because if you go back and look, four of the guys in the top 10, it was Rory, Cantlay, Hatton, and Keegan, all were part of that PMAM. They were all they were four of the top seven highest owned guys on the slate last week, and Kitayama was a PMAM guy too. If you built that, you pretty much landed on a lineup that had another PM guy. It's not that PMAM worked because the weather or your weather waves worked. It's you just stacked in a way that got off some of the other spots, used some of the chalk in a unique way, not who you play, it's how you play them. There's the prime example of it. You played the chalk, but you played the PM chalk in a lineup with a guy like Kitayama with an afternoon-only tee time that no one was really on. He wins the tournament. 
you've got a winning lineup. So that, that's just what I'm saying about these weeks. I don't mind stacking it up anyway. Now, the flip side to that, Pat, is this week, as when we get to DraftKings, I know we got one and done and stuff, but I think um, Day and Keegan, two of the highest owned guys on the slate from a value perspective, are both PMAM. So you're, again, you could do that example from last week using them. You would not have Cantley in those lineups like others may because he's in the morning going out AM, PM. Yeah, you just use Xander. Hey, we'll talk about him. No, I mean, or we won't. <laughs> if, if, if we if we don't use him, who's going to use him? Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's the look for one and done. I, I have yeah okay. We can talk about that. I was well, just I have some interesting Xander thoughts when we get to DK. But yeah, well, we'll what, was it fun to see us sitting in first place in the race for the Mayo Cup after one round last week? Yeah. We only had to hold five and a half more months. We couldn't even last the next round. It sucks, man. Rum huge round and then just disappeared on yeah. us. That, that's ter- that, that's like critical for us that we used Rom and he didn't get one of the big caches when everyone else is going to get the big cash out of Rom. And if we had not known that Cust was using Rory this week, we could have used Rory last week. That's and true. Second, and then we would have been all set. But we still have this week, and this is the week that you need to nail. I, I mean, you don't – It's yes, you have to have a good week. I don't think you're completely dead like where we're at if we only get a million bucks this week instead of the oh, yeah, we're four and a half. You're, you're not dead. But if you're out of it – or you sorry, if you think you're out of it right now, you're not – because if you can just get the winner this week, you'd be right back in the mix. Put it, put it this way. We're in 161st place. We're not that far off the lead. With a win last week, we would have been in first place, and mm-hmm. that would have brought us up to just around $10 million. Even if you have like a million dollars right now, you win this week, what is it, four to the winner? I think it's 4.5, yeah. 4.5, 4. so you're more than halfway back. Yeah, it's You just, just got to pick winners. Just go on a streak of trying to hit like three winners in six weeks, and all of a sudden you'll be at the top of the standing. It's so hard to do, but you're also never out of it at the same time. Love it. Morikawa or Xander? That's <laughs> funny you say that because I was going to bring up Morikawa and you brought up Xander. What I was going to say for Xander is later for DraftKings, just a way to set up your lineup builds. But I think uh, the thing about Morikawa, that's why I'm glad you brought him up, was that remember another thing like last year we talked about PMAM and everyone on it, including us, and not working. But remember last year, even with one and done, it was such a topic of conversation at the start of the season when people were planning that saying this last year, players, again, is still the biggest purse, but it was the biggest purse last year in history. And now it got even bigger, but they were saying, make sure you save guys like Morikow or JT, Ball Strikers Paradise. Let's play them at the players, collect all that money. This year, it doesn't feel like as many are going with Morikawa. His results, not great, but his game should fit here perfectly. On paper, it's probably the best course on tour for him if he can make a few putts. But he's that's always the case if he can make a few putts. If he can make it, it's not the case that like other places are going to be a bit more difficult because he's not the longest player off the tee. Here, that doesn't yeah. really matter. It's just hit your fairways, scorch your irons, and hopefully make a few putts. And we've seen a lot of bad putters win here. Yeah, that's what, okay, for sure that, but also like I'm saying, like, again, the variance of him just needing to do it. Yeah, we know we need a spike week from him on the greens, but like you said, this should be the spot where he has the opportunity to get that spike week. And if we get that $4.5 million looks pretty nice up top for him and for us. And listen, I mean, I obviously I bet him to win at 33 to one. I think he's down to 30, 25 in some spots as well. I mean, I just really like the 33 number. He's 30% used already in the one and done. And Mm -hmm. I just don't think people are going to him this week. I, I don't think so either. I actually like it quite a bit. And that's the thing with Xander. He's 35% used already in the one and done. No one is using that guy in one and done. Yeah. I don't. So here's the other thing. We have talked about Morikawa in the past. I think we had him in a recent conversation at a designated event where we talked about where you could save him for if you were. I don't know. where. where what, are you, what are we doing with Xander? Like Xander at the U.S. Open. Xander at the U.S. Open. Xander maybe at Memorial. Xander at the Masters. You can play him at a lot of places. I mean, yeah, it's Xander. His game pretty much travels extremely well to anywhere he goes, but I'm just saying in general, Morikawa, I just feel like this is the spot. All right. Call him Morikawa it is as our official one yeah, and let's done. Let's do it. Let's plug him in. I like yeah, because I, I don't want to take... Who do you think the highest known guy is going to be in one and done? Do you think it's going to be Rory? Might be Rory, yeah. Rory, Scheffler, or Day? Because people will burn Day here thinking this is his best chance to win any of these big tournaments. Yeah, I don't know as much about Scheffler. I guess if that's what people are down to. I guess Cantlay, too. Rory, Day, I was going to say, and Cantlay is what I think people go to. Day and Cantlay mainly because of the form that they're in. Day because of the form plus history. Cantlay more so what they watched on Sunday and saw what he did. So it's like, oh, he's just continuing to play well. Look at that ball striking, all that. And then Rory because he's Rory and his history here as well. So I think those three would be the highest. Not a terrible place to burn Rom either. Because no one will use ROM this week. That, that was kind of our logic last week. I think week. also people got to be running out of ROM. So if you have them, it's a nice little spot to use them. Let's see here. 60 or 70%. It's not like the overall. I just mean like they, a lot of people have used them versus... More, more people have used Homa 
and Xander than have used ROM so far this year. What's ROM at? 67%. Yeah, so one third. So uh, that's what I was trying to say is like that. I, I definitely know people have used them. The Homa stuff makes sense though because Homa sort of the West Coast start of the season. That's when people roll them out. And so all, John the Genesis Rahm. already happened, all that. <laughs> it should be John Rom, but that's, that's where he got more of his too. So I think this is a good spot if you have him. We'll talk about him a lot with DraftKings, I think, just in roster construction. If you had to guess top three owned in one and done, Rory, Rory Cantley Day, Rory Cantley Day, and pro- it might be in the order of Rory Day Cantley, just because I don't. No one's saving Day for anything. Is anyone saving Keegan for anything? And people love Keegan. He could be up there too. He's definitely more popular in the DraftKings streets because of price. Uh, the price. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I don't think Day and okay, we're going there and we're tying it together. But Day, well, and, let's talk about DraftKings. Yeah, let's, Day, let's Day and that. Keegan are. What's wrong with them besides ownership? They both look incredible everywhere. Their prices are look bad compared to the guys around them and their market and their betting and stuff. But we know this place, anybody can blow up in a heartbeat. You bet the missed the cup parlay for a reason. But really, I'm saying I really don't know what else to say. And I don't like to fade a guy just because of ownership. I, I think you can pick an easier case with Day and pick him apart than you can with Keegan at the moment. I think with Day, when you look at it, like he's still not hitting his approaches very well, mm-hmm. which is what you need to do here. I had it in my column up on DK Nation this week. Like the only guy who didn't hit his approach as well and won this tournament was Webb Simpson because he made every putt ever. And that's how... And chip he, in, by the way. And chip. Well, he was, around the green game was Well, he was putting from off the green. Yes. Uh, he made like three of those throughout the course of the week. <laughs> it was, was kind of nuts. nuts. Like day, and maybe he's just back to being this type of day because we've seen this run from him before. 4.9 on the greens, 5.8 on the greens, 3.7 on the greens, 4.3 on the greens, 4.1 on the greens four straight top tens. When you're gaining that many strokes on the greens every single week, you're probably going to come inside the top 10, even against the best fields. He's driving the ball really well. He's chipping really well, but that iron play, it's not worrisome because it hasn't been a disaster by any means. But if we're trying to find the guy who's going to gain seven strokes on approach and just give himself ample opportunities to make birdie after birdie or eagles on some of these par fives, he just doesn't seem like that guy right now. Like I, and someone brought up the good point. I think it was actually Kirshner last night. How many of these tournaments has Jason Day actually been in to win? None. Yeah, that's zero. Yeah, that is the issue. But at 8K, that's what sure. got to validate I, yeah. it differently. But it's true. And it's you're already you poked some good holes in that one. I don't know if you can do the same for Keegan, but I well, I, actually, I mean Keegan's easy. He won't putt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest one. But in general, I'm saying when you're talking about that's the other angle of it is these guys. Keegan can be your last guy in your lineup this week at 7500. I mean, Keegan actually has been putting. He gained seven strokes at the Farmers on the greens in three rounds. And his approach, his approach play has been good. His driving hasn't been as great. The chipping's actually been quite good. Yeah, it's harder to poke a hole in Keegan right now. He said he's so dialed right now. He's like, it's the best feeling ever. You can see that he's Wait, dripping Where in was that interview released? Was that on Barstool? I think it was on Barstool, and it was, I believe, right after his last round. Like, it was him coming in saying he's got every club in the bag, good to go. Such a feeling of confidence when you know that you're, you're all set there. And this week now, I just got to work on a couple little things, make sure I keep everything tuned up, and then we're good to go. I don't know. It's been working out, that's for sure. So, overall ownership. I think that we kind of hit on the three guys. Those three. Can't lay day Keegan. Rory. I, I, why is it that can't... I, I guess he's had two really good tournaments in a row. That is the answer to this question. Yeah. But I think it's funny that everyone's holding Xander's history at this event against him, but no one is holding Cantlay's against him. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me repeat. Let me go back to that and, and rephrase that. Because like Xander... The, the history thing, fine, but I don't think that's what's holding people against Xander. I think it's that you've got Scotty, Rory, Rom, yeah, Poma. It's not that it's even a bad price for Xander. He's got the complete game. I think Xander's an excellent golfer. It's that that's more what it's against him. The Cantley thing is more interesting, but it's because people are not taking course history into consideration as much this week because of the variance of the course. We know that. You can see a guy win one year, miss the cut the next two. You can see all kinds of different factors at this course with water in play so much. Worth noting, Cantlay, I believe, was one off Hideki's lead in 2020 before it got canceled in the first round. Like, he was having a really good tournament. <laughs> okay. I didn't think back that far because I know the only thing I remember from that day was the guy winning the Millie Maker complaining that he didn't get the Millie because it ended after one day. And I was like, no. hey, they should have let Cuss made the rule. Cuss is claiming his pick of Hideki winning that week as <laughs> as it actually happened. He would have loved it. I think they had to finish the first round for there to be like a, and they didn't. a legal factor to it. But they no, they did pay out first round leader on Hideki. I remember that. Yeah, the books will do that just because... Just because you know, they don't want to deal you know, with it. Don't be headache. pissed off. He crushed. I get it. We'll we we, we want you to keep... We know sports it's is shutting... coming back somewhere. Yeah, anyway. we know sports is shutting down for three months. We want you to have money in your account so you can bet on, like, marble races. <laughs> yeah. or Rocket the fuck League, we were baby. Doing the Rocket pandemic. League. Let's go. Lo- League of Legends, too. So, ah, at this moment, I see that Thomas has passed Cantlay in terms of ownership, uh, at least what I'm seeing. I don't know if I necessarily buy that. It does seem like Cantlay is a far more publicly backed play. 
Yeah. Rather than people who run optimizers or anything like that. Splitting hairs. I've got Cantley about two percent higher owned than J- Justin Thomas. Okay. Doesn't matter. They're going to be. They're going to be. They're going to be high. Owned, they're going to be higher owned though. So for sure. Day Keegan. I think Day with a bullet is number one in ownership, and you're probably looking. And it's probably I have probably undercalculated what his ownership is going to be. And the big twenty-five dollar millionaire maker. I bet you he's twenty five percent. I was going to say twenty five to twenty eight. So yeah. we're same same. So I, I was putting I, ranges. I'm so that's what I'm thinking. But, yeah. Yep, I think that's the case in the higher dollar, smaller field stuff. It's just even safer to go to a guy like him and Keegan. So Cantlay, all those guys, pick it up. That, that's what that was last week. Remember, I told you this on the show. Cantlay was ninety one hundred. I was like, he's going to be owned. Watch and see, and ends up being super high owned. It's just people go to him based on the odds in the market. When you go look at his betting odds right now, it, it, last week it was similar to the guys that were 900 bucks or a thousand bucks more than him. That just translates to the ownership. This is interesting though, Pat, because usually on a stronger field, softer priced event on DraftKings, like the majors and all these bigger events, you do see it spread out a little bit more. Yet this week, I think like top row, Rory, next row, Cantlay, Day, Keegan. We have like our four main in each category. And then you can fill in the secondary guys with the Schefflers, the Justin Thomases, the you know the guys you go down from the Hattons, all those guys. Like I feel like I have a good beat on ownership for this week, and that should be helpful going into these large field tournaments. How much stock do you put into how guys are owned versus their performance at this tournament in particular? Because I, I wrote it up, just the here are the ten highest owned guys, here are the ten highest owned scores, here how like from the past two years. Right. Is two years too just little of a sample to put any stock into whatsoever, or is there something too? And because, I mean, you mentioned the narrative, watch this be the year, the, you know, the high variance tournament, the chalk smashes. smashes. Yeah, sometimes happens. But I I think you're just with, with what can go wrong so quickly for anyone on this course, just if you have a decision between two players and you know, one is going to be lower owned for sure, just take the lower owned guy. Because I don't think there's that big of a difference between anyone. Yeah, but I, I think that's what I'm saying. I know some people do this to their, you know, testament. It's, they have success with it where they just fade the top 10 guys. And this would be a week to do it because we know some of them are going to likely bust. But what ends up happening is if you get a week like last week where if you did that, you were crying. you didn't even what? get the winner, but four of the top seven own guys end up in the top 10. You're, yeah. just, you're not getting to anywhere near the top Pat Mayo when has, you do that. Pat Mayo has a six of six in the $200 single entry. Doesn't cash. Missed the, missed the yeah, cash see, line by a half wild. point. Yeah, that's insane having that. That's, that hurts. Because what was well, six six last week, I think was 15%. 15-ish percent. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to say. But I, so. I, I didn't have enough guys at T2 as it turned out. Yeah, that's the problem. And that, and that you get the, uh, the old double position placement points or trip, well, not, not double, sorry, you get to double down on whoever has them. So if you got four guys, T2, you get 18 points per guy. So it's just the way it goes. And or 20 or whatever it is. And all my Kitayama lineups were scumbag by Ben Ann. Yeah. I had five, I think, of 50 Kitayama lineups, and just all of them were five of sixes. <laughs> and they beat my six of sixes. Yeah, that's, that happens if you got the winner. So here's what I was uh, looking at. You can find this on DK Nation. You can also find it in the newsletter that will be out on Wednesday as well. Reminder to play in the DraftKings Listeners League. There's still 350 spots left of the 5,000. There's, was it $75,000 of yeah, rake, rake-free week. guaranteed money? You probably want to get your hands on that. Better than playing in the Millionaire Maker. Yeah, Not going to lie to you. Yeah, it's great. Uh, to look at it right now. So last year, and is there anything that we can take away from last year because everyone has now said like oh it was such a shit show you had guys pushed 90 hours and it finished on a fucking tuesday of three weeks from when it started (laughs) and all that i do think that there probably is something you can take away from that though not necessarily how the performance is but even when it comes to constructing DraftKings lineups or wave stacks like did you learn anything from last year's tournament not really okay i mean what i learned from last year that i would apply to future tournaments is that nobody stacks full waves even when the people tell you you should (laughs) And it didn't work out, but, but on the PMAM. But if you remember last year's Sky Post, it was six percent and, and change PMAM. Only one percent went the opposite side. You would have absolutely smashed. I don't know if you would have found the exact winner, but you would have had a lot of opportunity if you had to just stack the other side of the way. So I take away DraftKings stuff and and strategy and theory and stuff I focus on for process. But from even the original question you asked me, Pat, like is two year sample size? I just don't care. Because it's you can definitely find stuff in it. We will be able to lean back on it. You and I both do this and do content. So if we if you find something that worked and you can talk about it next week, it's true. So it's great. We'll lean <laughs> back on it. But it is still more for that purpose to me than it is for like, oh, if this is the way. Like people hit me up all the time. I'll give you one last example and then I'll end the rant. But oh, this type of build has never won at this tournament. You, your 10, 9, 9, 8, 8, 7 didn't ever win here before. What's, what are you tracking? The last five years at this place? Like, I don't care. The pricing set up differently. The caliber of players is different. It's a whole new season, new year, everything. Anything can happen and change. 
I'm not building for that. Like I, I don't look at that stuff at, at all. I do the same thing when it comes to betting as well. Like no first time players won here since the first time it was played here. Until he does. Until he does. Yeah. It was the same thing when Morikawa went to the Open Championship. Like, well, Morikawa. Not. I mean, he, he was down talking his game. Played very poorly at the at the Genesis Scottish Open the week before, but no first timer had gone over and won. Then he did. Right. So like, why can't Tom Kim win this week? Yeah. That, and also, he's been a debutante and won. At places already yeah, within the last like eight months. Yeah, so it's like he can definitely show up and do it, and that's where again uh, I posted a thing in the tidbits today. There is a note on the debutants here. Obviously, it's, ha- it's have done very poor for the big caliber names on their on their first time out, but it, it's there is something to it. You do this course is tricky. You have to know there's so many risk versus reward spots. Like, do I just chop it out and then go up, or do I just jam it up there and then hopefully I can play a better around the green game? But what if my lie shit? Like, there's so many angles to play with this type of course, but you're still talking about some some heavy hitters like Tom Kim, if you believe that he is still Tom Him that we've talked about in the past and he's that guy, then you could definitely go to him here and, and take a shot with him, I think. Last year, the, where is it? Yes, the highest owned players, Matt Fitzpatrick, 25%, missed the cut. Berger, 24%, T13, so that was good at 8,800. Morikawa, 24%, missed the cut. Thomas, 23%, T33. Scheffler, 20%. T55, Cantlay missed the cut, Rom T55, Gooch missed the cut, Horschel missed the cut. Looking at it from two years ago, Finau was the highest owned guy, if we remember. Missed the cut, Webb missed the cut, Cantlay missed the cut, the three mm-hmm. highest owned guys. Uh, then you had Neiman and Morikawa, T29, T41, Zalatoris, T21 at almost 20%, and then Fleetwood missed the cut at 17%. It's just funny to look. It was, I, I think looking back two years ago is a bit more instructive of when you look at the highest scoring players because thomas was the highest scoring he was 17 percent bryson was 13 percent he was the third highest then you had westwood at three percent like though i think that's what i found the most looking back at what happens at the players is that you're gonna find unlike some of the other tournaments where you know we talk about the u.s open like oh you know you probably don't need this two percent guy to be in your lineup like the the six percent denny mccarthy types are good for the u.s open because the bottom of the field is so bad. The bottom of the field is really good right? at this turn. Which is a conversation about Rom we're going to have in a second. But that, to, just to answer one last thing on that, though, like I talk about, it's not exact same, but like a roulette wheel. It's like when people look at the last two years and go, oh, it's red, red. It's got to be... Uh, got to be black this time so I'm going to switch to that like it's just not the case it's a totally different spin like last year was green actually it landed on double zero because <laughs> the people stack and, and that's why the chalk was bad last year too what, what did everybody stack last year PM guys for the most part even if they didn't go full stack to my original point PM guys were popular last year because the weather edge it could have worked out and then things got delayed and it didn't work out is there really a takeaway from that to me no like that you, uh, you could take other things away but I'm not going to say oh the chalk always misses here we're talking about two to three years in general and even to go back and look at it a little bit further, the, the one thing I noticed with this versus some of the other like big field major tournaments is that you legitimately get 1% players inside the top 10 scoring. And it happens on a regular occurrence where it doesn't happen yeah. on any of these other. Like Lahiri was 0.5% owned last year. <laughs> yeah, De- definitely a much better tournament. This is one of the spots for sure to embrace the variance by playing some of these lower owned guys, yes. like you said on that. And you could do it via fading the chalk as well. But the point is, like I said, like what, like some of these guys, it was hard to poke holes in Keegan. Would it surprise you if he ends up having another top 10? It would yeah, not T- surprise T7, me. T7 for T- Keegan. It can happen. Like it definitely can happen. And that's probably going to be in somebody's lineup that has the one percenters mixed in with it. So you just have to be careful how you build out your lineups. Don't go can't lay day, Keegan, et cetera, and expect to have good leverage as a way to get to the top. You can still find it with some lower owned plays, and if those guys all hit, you'll need them. That's my point. But it's all what your strategy is, what your goals are, and what you're trying to build for. I'm trying to build for the top of a $25 tournament with a million dollars up top. It's probably not going to include those three guys in similar lineups together. Do you think Vegas is going to end up being popular? Not enough. Yeah. I thought about it at the start of the week, for sure, because people were mentioning him, and he's only 6,800. But I think it's uh, the new age. We talked about it where the sevens are the new 6Ks. I think he is one of the guys in the 6Ks that pushes that 5 to 7 or 5 to 8% range. But not Which 13, maybe nowadays 14. you want to consider the 10% mark that people used to say just automatically fade it. But I definitely don't see him hitting double digits at 6,800. Do you think Vegas or Webb is more owned at 6,800? Because I think those are the two guys that are pulling I, I've the got them pretty similar. Yeah. So it's like coin flip, basically? For ownership. Yeah. I don't have my co- Are you going to play Webb off the 10 birdies or whatever in the final round? I mean, I bet Webb to win. Yeah. Yeah, I am. As long as he hasn't, he's going to have his one bad round. Just have it happen in round three, not round two. Yeah. And then we'll be good. That's what happened at Honda, I think. 
Because <laughs> he had the bad round round two and he ended up missing the cut. It, it was close. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. Justin Su is one who's garnering ownership in the 6Ks. And then Davis Riley. Like, Davis Riley is the actual one who has a chance to potentially push double digits, I think, yeah. when it comes around. I don't know if he's going to get there. I've got him 7 to 10 range. Yeah. That so seems right. So that's not – you just can't play. I can't play that. No. That, to me, is the same one. I love Davis Riley, and what he did last week was incredible. But coming off that one spot, like, you, I can't just – You want to win money in. on Davis Riley? Hopefully he misses the cut this week. Bet him to win the Valspar next week. Oh, we would love that. That might actually be the reason why this plan fails. <laughs> because what's going to happen is you know he's going to crush again this week. And then the odds are going to be cratered for next week when you want to bet him at the Valspar. So I, I don't know. I, I just – I like other guys down there that I could go to, but I also think there is something to be said just for, uh, you know, some good lineups that avoid some of the, like uh, some good constructed lineups that are more balanced, but that still avoid like the Keegan Day setup where you can just go above and below them and get different that way. Is Ben Griffin going to be double digits? How much is he on here? 7,100. No. No? I don't think so either. And he's also a first-timer. I actually like him a lot this week. but I think that. he's been mentioned enough. I had him in the tidbits. People do like him. There's some stuff on him. Like I just think in general, uh, it's another one. The range is there's just so many guys in there. There is. So I don't think he's going to be much. Though. He might end up being like 5%. Yeah. I, I'm play him, no I, I, I am playing him. I'm, I'm yeah, not going to back He's been great. His ball striking has been awesome. Like There's no, no reason you have to go away from him. I'm just saying that's that's and, a reason and, why it's... And all of his best performances come on like this style of short course. Yeah. Like all of the... I mean, he even had a nice week last week that was mainly putting influence, but driving, putting, and approach shots all coming on short Bermuda courses. So I've constructed a lineup of what I think... I think there's two ways to play this. So here's the first one of like the, the chalkiest lineup possible. Mm-hmm. Rory, Cantley, Day, Keegan, Davis, Riley, Ben Griffin. That's let, one of them. Let me get to that one because that's the one we'll use as the guideline. This is this is how we usually start it, but this is the best way because this is really pretty good chalk lineup, like what you said. Like it's going to make sense. We know why people are going to these plays. It leaves uh, 200 bucks on the table. Yeah. And not Lonto, Griffin, Ben. All right, we got the starting point. Okay. And this has a 11K... 9K, 8K, two sevens, and a six. Okay, go ahead. So the other way I think you can play this that's also just gravitating around the same sort of ownership is you turn, let's see here. You take away the bottom two. In Are gri- we keeping Day and Keegan? Yes, we're keeping Day and Keegan. Okay. But we're going to Connors and Mitchell at the bottom, who I think are going to be pretty highly owned. Keith Mitchell. And then we turn Rory into Homa. And it leaves $100 on the table. So Homa, Cantlay, Day, Keegan, Connors, Mitchell. Yeah. And so to bring that up, that, again, we always just say this, but first time listeners or watchers is the projections. I'm not really caring about them as much just to try and validate and compare. And we know why it's different when you include Davis, Riley, and Ben Griffin. But they project pretty well for down there. But this what was what I was saying. This one projects almost 20 points better. Because, because you're Connors and you're Mitchells and you're, you still have Homa in there. Like you're getting a bunch of opportunity that... Look, this may be too chalky of a version for what you might want to get some leverage in these in these higher field ter- or higher field tournaments, but I'm saying that this is the type of build that still is good if you can find a unique version of it. So let's try to find a unique version of it. I, I think that very easily. Oh, if you just switch home to switch home to Xander. Xander, done. Almost projects the exact same, and that'd be way less owned because it's Homa versus Xander at like what ten to twelve percent. I don't even think Xander gets a 10%. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I, I haven't projected it around, like, in that like 8 to 12 range right now. I, but I, I feel like we see more extreme pulls in these bigger tournaments where the guys that are highly priced that aren't popular end up being a lot less popular than even we project for. You're like, well, mm-hmm. how could Xander? Like, cause even to look back at last year, uh, when I pull that up again, was it last year? For yeah, Z- for Xander, he missed No, for Dustin last year. I think he was like... St- 5.7% or something like that. Oh, yeah. It was like, okay. I think we all had to project it at like 9%. It's like, no. Uh, if, it, if it's very clear that people aren't playing someone, it manifests in these big fields that people play them way less than you think. And also, I remember two people doing their ownership projections are trying to get it tight. They know like the certain areas, like we know this week with the Keegans, the Days, the Hattons, the Rorys, those ones. But on some of Alexander, they'll just pick somewhere in the middle. So when they balance out and get their ownership numbers, it still looks like they're pretty accurate overall because they just tried to get a, as close to the number as possible. He could end up coming in way lower, to your point. So the way that I would think about the 10K plus, there's only four guys up there. Rory, Ben Scheffler, I think with a bullet, are going to be over 20%, maybe each. Or Rory sneaks up and costs Scheffler a little bit. But I think it's going to be Rory number one, Scheffler number two, Gap to Rom, who 
I was speaking with you. I, did we say this on the show or is this pre-show that he might come in at under 10%? Pre, pre-show. Also, when you say with a bullet, I'm just curious. Is that like an asterisk or with a gun to your head? With, you a, gun saying? My, with, a, with a gun to my head. With a bullet. Okay, I like that. It's a new one. I never heard that one. So that's a good saying. Okay, well, we can go back to it. I, I think if you look from uh, Rom, that's the other one that we got to talk about because you said the original version with like Riley and Griffin move Rory to Rom. How, how does that land? Because then... Okay, so let's, let's try that. Let's import that lineup. It's like another different version of it, right? So it, you still get Keegan. Does it fit Rom? So we, we still need to find $600. Yeah. And that's very easy because you can turn Griffin into Kramer Hickox. Super simple. Don't you think people... Oh, I was going to say you're going to do that. Okay. And then I, I was going to say... I think then I can move do Davis Riley back up to Justin Su. Or Webb Simpson or, or Vegas or whoever it is. I mean, you can... Uh, you're keeping Cantlay in there. Rom, Cantlay, Day, Keegan. Then you have 6,500 for the next two guys, right? So uh, of the guys that I have starred right now... Uh, Hickok, Cole, Sam Ryder, Brandon, woo, Steven Yeager, your guy, Aaron Rye, Davis Thompson, Justin Suh, Adam Svensson, Robbie Shelton. Those guys are all $6,600 and below. Take your pick of those. God, I just said, like, I don't want to play Riley at that ownership, but I just found it with, if you go Rom, Cantlay, Day, Keegan, Riley, Yeager. My guy Jaeger bombs. That, that it, fits perfectly? That fits perfectly. I yeah. mean, I really like Brandon Wu this week. But by the way, that lo- that lineup, because Riley is not actually going to get to, like we said, like he may end up being at 7%. You still have a guy under 10%. Jaeger's even lower owned than him. So you got a 2 to 3% owned guy there. And then Rom up at the top is going to be one of the lowest owned of, high, the, high end guys. of the stud. So that's where I'm saying you're not really, you're not that crazy with this build. And you still have Keegan and Day. But uh, you got it with Cantley. That's the one thing I don't love is you got all three of them together. So I don't like that, but I just say that's how you can bring it together. That might be the only lineup I have with all three of those guys in the same one and $25 or something. But I, I don't love it personally. Uh, I, I Instead of going Riley and Jagger, I went with Woo and Sue. Okay. Uh, at Su-woo? 64 and 60, 66. Sue Woo Kim. So, I mean, those are two guys that I am actively playing this week yeah. at 64. And like I mentioned, Kramer Hickok is the is the min at 6,000. I think he I think he's going to make the cut. And maybe he can run a hot putter. He's been running a hot putter recently. You know who lo- might... lo- Loves some Florida golf. Hasn't missed a cut at the players. Two you know, for two. You're sleeping on another guy at min price. Another guy at min Your price? Boy. Your boy had a nice Sunday, too, last week. Watney, Laird, Hickok, Kelly Crap, Burns. Party Marty. Party Marty's week was nice last week. Was it really? I, I didn't think even, so. Go back and check. Didn't even notice. This. Yeah, he came 39th last week. It was something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's lost off the tee in three straight, lost around the greens in four straight, lost on the greens in four straight. He's not my favorite. I'm just saying, like, you, you like him usually. So if you go to him, he's a... I, I would prefer Hickok this week. Like, the numbers actually look good for Hickok, which is really strange. Like, he's gone... He was 29th at the Genesis. He was 14th at the Honda. Gained off the tee. Gained on approach. Gained around the greens. Lost marginally on the greens. But when you take a look back at what he's done at this tournament, uh, he gained almost five strokes on the greens two years ago at the players. Like, I, he can figure these out. He gained yeah. uh, almost six strokes ball striking last year at the players in this tournament. So I, I don't think he's the worst play. I'm, I'm going to play him this week. If he's not my loser of the week, like he's not going <laughs> to show up in like 40% of my lineups. I think that might be... I think it might be Justin Su. You think Justin Su is the guy? I think he is. He hit like accuracy is his game. He's been Mr. Irons over the past month or so. And the one thing that everyone kind of holds against him is his putting. That's only because they watched the Honda. And dude legitimately couldn't make a putt on the weekend. But in the three other tournaments over the last month, he's gained like at least four strokes putting. Okay, then I get the best lineup for you. Okay, let's hear I love this lineup. Rom with Xander. Then you can go to the chalk day Keegan and you land on Sir Hickok with a hundred bucks to go. That is a much better build than the one we had before, based on the fact that you don't have Cantley in there. You've got Xander instead. You're unique by going with Rom Xander. You skip the entire nine K range. You only use day out of the eight K. You can still play Keegan. If you want, you can move off Keegan too. I'm just saying we, you said you'd be more likely to move off day. You could go day to Tom Kim. So th- this is where I wanted to go with this. So what do you got? Uh, and I'll turn Brandon Wu into Hickok. I'm just trying to rejig this lineup a little bit. Does this work? Oh, it does too. Say so my right. favorite version of this lineup is Rom with Hickok at the bottom and Justin Sue at 66. Okay. Homa, Tom, Kim, Siwoo. Homa, Tom, Kim, Siwoo. So let me build that one and see how it projects against it. Homa. It probably very poorly. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, guess. against it. The other one wasn't projecting great either. I don't care about that. Just we're, t- we're looking at well, none of the, that's what people have to remember too. And we talk about this on the show. Somebody asked, oh, like, I, I don't, do I play your lineup that you said projected like 30 points less? It's golf projections. Yes, you can. Absolutely. It's like, we're saying it's to get a baseline. We know these are going to project less. We're not trying to have the same build everyone else does. That's why everyone has those guys is because on all the projection sites, it pro- projects so well. If you're going to use the high projected guys, that's where the, not who you play, it's how you play them. You have to think about it and be thoughtful building these lineups. Ours are going to project less, taking the risk, the quote unquote riskier play. And then you remember it's golf at Sawgrass. It's not really that risky. It's basically just taking the same dude for less ownership. So Because I, I feel like Homa probably projects Actually, maybe he doesn't project better than Cantlay. In my mind, he's a better player than Cantlay, so I, that's why I bet him to win and didn't bet Patrick Cantlay to win. So right. I prefer Homa to Cantlay objectively. Homa but, projects like Kawa, JT in that range. Cantlay slightly higher. That's again, people that's go crazy. off the odds. Again, people just go off the odds. The odds, and that's where. So are you telling me Mav McNeely does not rate out well this week? <laughs> yeah. 0.1 percent owned Mav McNeely. I looked at owner when I was is that, like, is doing that my wor- stuff. Hold on, is that the worst pricing? In one of these tournaments ever? <laughs> Probably. But what I don't know. Is it, though? Because why is he that? Like, it's, you know, just, what was it, two months ago that we would have been saying a whole different story here? Or three months ago? Yeah. And then, obviously, the downward spiral from there leads to this. But I legit thought he was, like, WD with an injury or something when I saw the ownership projections <laughs> across sites to, you know, build it out and stuff. I was like, wow. Is he even playing? I had to go look this up. And he is, in fact, here. He is playing. Yeah. Uh, most definitely. Uh, and I would guess Day projects better than Tom Kim. And Keegan obviously projects better than C. Wu. So obviously you're going to lose stuff when you pivot onto these guys. Yeah. But I like those guys better. But, and that's what I'm saying. It's not as be- When these projections show a guy is three or four less, and then you tie... Like that's a birdie. Right. And then you <laughs> multiply it by the six guys, right? That's your 18 points. And we say, oh, it projects 20 points less. Yeah, no shit. But it's only three points per guy. It's a birdie per guy on classic slate. And there's, you have to factor in ownership and you have to factor in construction and, and, and the type line. of field that you're in, a cut line still for, at least for this event. And then you keep going from there. But this one is uh, 11, 9, 8, 7, 6, 6. So it's still pretty pretty unique in that sense. And this has like no ownership attached to so the highest owned guy in this lineup is probably Homa. Homa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Homa will be... It's, I'm Homo, still Homo will be above what you think he's going to be. Well, I want I wonder what you actually think Rom will be. I know you said it already, but I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that way. I should say I wonder what we actually see Rom be because I know what you're thinking. I think it's less than 10. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. But I, I understand no, why I, you think it. I, I think and I'm not. Pe- people tell me that Rom sucks in Florida. He's just terrible. Yeah, that was interesting. It's yeah, we... just like when I picked Morikawa to win. Did you know he also sucks and can't win tournaments? Yes. I've heard that about Colin Morikawa, two-time major winner. But yeah, he, he's terrible. Patrick Cantlay is good, though. But Colin Morikawa sucks. Yeah, this that, is that's, where... that's what people have told me. That's where the problem lies in the situation of like a Cantlay versus Morikawa. Pay Cantlay... Morikawa! Cantlay's super high-owned. It's like this <laughs> one guy is, you know, major winner two times, all these things, can even off a bad week when he says he doesn't have his clubs in line, goes and wins the, the, the Open, all that stuff. It's like that's why sometimes in these majors – or an event like the players where it's not, I'm not even calling it the fifth major saying these higher, stronger field, bigger events. Sometimes it's better just to pick the caliber of the long term that, you know, like the major winner could Cantley win a major. He could, he yeah, has sure, though, but no one is saying Cantley is bad. No but people are saying Morikawa is bad, which yeah. is just really bizarre to me. Yeah. Another thing that I wanted to get to, uh, and the, the point I was trying to make earlier about the ownership percentages and where these guys finish on the leaderboard. And I, I think that the two years ago is especially the one that you want to look at it. So once again, to circle back to the year that Justin Thomas won, when you take a look at who the highest owned guys were, you had three and four were 10-7 Morikawa, 10-4 Justin Thomas. No, that is not right. I'm looking at the wrong year. <laughs> you had Tony F- 9-1 Tony Finau, 9-5 Webb Simpson. How far we've come in two years. Now he's 6-8. And 9-2 Patrick Cantlay, 9-4 Colin Morikawa. So of the five highest owned guys, four of them were in the 9K range. Two of the top three scores were in the 9K range, and they weren't those guys. Yeah. So if everything is, let's say, a coin flippy situation with the 9Ks, like is there really that big of a difference between Homa, Cantlay, Morikawa, Finau, Thomas, and Sungjae? It's probably not, right? So why not just go with the guy who's like half-owned? Yeah, that's the case. That's what I said. Like embracing that variance. Even at the high... People... That's the other thing too, Pat. Everyone always says, oh, like I I'm sort of go against this all the time. The diamond in the rough factor. People think you need to find a 1% guy. You need to find Kitty Yama. Which is not true and always. Didn't. Like that's... Yeah, and then he hits. But, I'm saying, but but what I'm saying is when people think they look... When we when people say 1% guy, they say they go right to the bottom of the board. Mm-hmm. It's like, why aren't you looking for like the 5 or 6% owned guy 
8K or up that can definitely compete with these guys and contend, has good odds, all these factors. Like, that's where you can get different. Or in some cases, it's more extreme. If Rom is 12%, yeah, it's not a, a 1% guy, but it's Rom at 12%, and the rest of the guys are 25%, 20%, 18%, all this stuff where that's kind of your quote-unquote diamond in the rough up top, the guy that's probably the best player in the world right now. That, that's what I keep getting back to, because I think I wrote it up and go, I did read it. I don't think I did. I, I wrote it, so I remember it. Rom is plus money in a head-to-head matchup against Rory this week. Now, do I think that Rom is a better fit for this course than Rory? Probably not. But I do think that Rom's a better player right now. And that any time that you could get Rom at plus 110 against any player in the world, I think you take it. Because at worst, it's a coin flip. And then you're getting plus 110 on a coin flip. Yeah. And that's essentially what we're seeing in the breakdown of the ownership right now. Rory at 25%, maybe 28%. Rom potentially at 10%, 9%, 11%. Like that just seems crazy not to play Rom at that point. At that point, unless you're like you're convinced Rory's going to win, is anyone convinced Rory's going to win anything? I think there is people that are definitely convinced. That I think it's hard. again like we did the game earlier with Keegan and Day. Let's you want to do the Rory game? Poke your holes. What what what's this like? Rory is owned for a reason too. His history, former winner, you know, playing great golf right now. Still uh, showed some signs last week. I know it's like kind of the situation, but you we made fun of Day not being in it to win it. True. Rory was definitely there and could have won that tournament last week. I'll give you the biggest hole to pick here. And sometimes it's a lot like the Justin Thomas hole that you can pick too. Rory's always going to drive the ball really far and well and gain a bunch of strokes off the tee, except for at places like this, where a tinge off, and we've seen it with Thomas, where when Thomas won, he was just hitting that like low draw that he almost put in the drink on the 72nd hole. It stayed out of the water Mm -hmm. for him. But he was just able to hit all the fairways. We've seen years of this tournament where he can't hit shit, and it's just in the middle of the water. Because I was watching back, I think it was two years ago, and they were showing like the best shots from the tournament, the worst shots for a tournament. It cuts to Rory. It's like, Rory's plus 11 or something like that. Like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Like, I don't remember this at all. But he just had a really bad go of it. And that can happen to Rory, I feel, more so than it happens to Rom. Plus, you have the caveat of... Rory is no different than, he's more consistent than Tom Kim and Morikawa and Zalatoris on the greens because he can really spike up, but he has his bad weeks. Rom rarely has a bad week on the green. That's why I like Homa so much. He had his worst putting performance in a year and a half. Like, he's typically not going to lose four strokes putting. It just doesn't happen to him. He could definitely win the players. Like, it doesn't just that, feels like a, doesn't he feel like the perfect players champion? It do, he does as a kickoff. I think then it continues on like he's going to win a major. Or, I think, or maybe so. he doesn't. Maybe we look back on it. And it's just like the Matt Kuchar and the Ricky Fowler. Maybe, but well, I will say that I'm not sure if you watch the stuff with Rom, but man, he is very confident. He's like, buddy, I missed by like a hair here, a hair there. Like I don't care. I'm coming back to crush this. He's dialed in. It's always the way Rom is extremely competitive, expecting to win everything. This is one he definitely wants as, as the others do as well. I'm just saying in general, you could tell that from his interview. And then I forgot one thing earlier. I forgot this tidbit today too. And I don't know who dropped it, but it just, there was a reminder. We knew this, but Joe Scovran, used to be Ricky's caddy is on Tom is now Tom Kim's caddy for a little while. And I forgot about that because we just talked about the old Tim Tucker experience last week, getting the job done with Kitty Yama, who he'd formerly won at the API with Bryson. And so little, little things like that, that you see sometimes can be helpful for at least knowing where to go. Cause we talked about this course. If Tom Kim hits a bunch of fairways, a bunch of greens, just like kind of like needing to find the putter. If he's got the information, which they, Ricky's a player's champion, always played well here. Joe's on the bag, played with caddy for Ricky. If he gets that information, I've seen this. You definitely want to do this. He, he know he can actually do it. Right. So me, me tell someone you should play this way or go do that. Like it may or may not work because they may not have the experience or the ability them doing it, it's you're playing with one of the best golfers in the world. He can do what you tell him to do if you give him the right information. So uh, I think it could be pretty good for him as well. And, and it's not, I feel like you're going to know pretty quickly if he has the greens figured out or not. That's how we, it, it, same goes with Morikawa. Like you see it at the beginning of tournaments. Like if they can just gain strokes round one, they generally kind of keep that up. Like that is their path to victory if everything else is going well for them. So uh, I'm very. With, the, with that said, I want to do a lineup here. Let's do this because we talked about it and I, I actually like this for these types of events. I'm just going to start it with Homa. Morikawa and Tom Kim okay. under the premise, Pat, that like you talked about some of those prices from previous years where guys went up and Webb went way down and all this, but like, just to bring it up, you could see Homa winning this thing. I could see Morikawa winning this thing. Tom Kim, we just I mean, talked the, about, I, I bet all three of these guys. So I can, in my right. mind, I can see them winning. And so now we're at 7,500. And now what I'm trying to do though, and stick with the theme here, this is where a themed lineup. I don't really care about the other stuff, but it just makes sense to me of like, who is the guy in the seven K's 
that you think you could see being a lot more expensive next year at this event. Like he could have a great season this year. He's already shown some signs. Like let's plug in the next guy that's like that. We- weirdly, and this is a range that I want to get to as well. I could see Corey Connors running hot with a putter for three months okay. and ending up with like a Molinari type run. And then he just goes back to being who he was, or maybe even worse at that point. And he, he fits like he's going to, he hits typically again, we'll see what happens, but ton, ton fairways, fairways, greens, can you, it's kind of the same. And I, I don't think it's the same though as when we say we're not building like a Keegan Bradley, Luke list, all the ball strikers that just need to find a putter. Yeah, we're you, building some caliber guys. In sure. Here. But I mean, if you're going to make the case for Keegan Bradley of why he can win this event, you can make, the equal case, I think, to a slightly lesser degree, but at far better odds and a cheaper DraftKings price, that Corey Connors can win too. <laughs> like they do the same. They do exactly the same thing. <laughs> Canadian bias. We're going to get called out on this one, but I, I do agree that again, as a guy at seventy four hundred bucks here, l- lower owned than Keegan probably too. Well, he is going to garner ownership. We already have Homa Kawa Kim starting it off. So I, I'm just saying, I do like your call on that, and I think it's it would would it's I guess the way I look at these lineups, Pat is. Would it surprise you if not only he had a great finish here or was in the mix on Sunday again like he was last week for a little bit before he disappeared? Uh, Saturday, he was at least in the mix. No, and could he continue it? Like, would you? And then he's in it at the Masters, he always is, and all these facts. So he makes sense. Who, who's somebody else down here? Because we now also still have 7,500 and change to pick two more guys. Like, who's another guy like that? Or can you just round it out with, you know, I mean, Siwoo Keegan? You, you, I don't know if Siwoo Keegan works. I don't think we have quite enough money for that. We have exact money but, for that. But do we actually? Yeah. <laughs> then yes, let's do that. that. But isn't that a line? Like all these guys, one's a former champion. Keegan, we just compared. If me and you, we, we're not on opposite sides this week, but if we were playing our game of Keegan versus Connors, we, just could, do both. we could go back and forth on it and try and make the case. And I would, with you, put Keegan higher. But... We don't need to figure out the ownership when we've got Tom Kim, Si Wu, starting it with Homa and Morikawa. Like, it's already different enough. And that lineup is actually pretty solid. And it doesn't have Day or Cantlay. It doesn't have Rory. It projects very well. And it's extremely, well, not extreme, but it's much lower owned than what the other ones were. If you want to play that same game, I think that you could look at it and say that this is a Thigala breakout party as well. I don't like Thigala this week, but almost every single person I talk to does like him this week. Mm-hmm. I'd just rather play Siwoo. Yeah, they're the same price. Now, who would you rather play between? Them? Siwoo. Yeah, just looking at it here, it's it's pretty close. Yeah. I don't know. The Thigala... Siwoo plays well where Siwoo plays well. Thigala top five <laughs> thing has been real, though, lately. I think he's up there in the top three on the PGA Tour for top fives this season. Yeah, and listen, he's also quite... He's probably less volatile than Siwoo historically, although Siwoo has become a bit more consistent. Uh, this season and over the past year than he's ever been. Don't we, you, you're the best at this. You're the Siwoo Whisperer. Like, we usually just play him at Siwoo Tracks. It's this is like, one of them. It, of course it is. That's what I'm saying. But that's why I'm just sticking with it. Like, it makes sense. And even if you go back to it with Siwoo, here's the thing about him. And it, it's why it kind of fits the Siwoo Tracks narrative. But you go back to even a place like the RBC Heritage and look at how he does off the tee there. It's awesome. He, he's very good with the placement of the ball. Again, Siwoo Kim. The guy can go off track in a minute and throw a 10 on the board and it's game over. But when you're already, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're already building into your lineup like we did there, I don't think it's a problem to go the other way. Like if you if you want to play Thigala instead, I I, w- I definitely wouldn't fault you, but I just have no problem with it with Siwoo in there as well. I I just look back at the types of players. I mean, I, I've talked about the Wyndham Championship thing a bunch this week. I believe in that to be true. That there's something about the Wyndham Championship, the way that it's laid out, how you have to attack that course. You, there's too many of the same guys that have won both events. Didn't Tom Kim win it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's another one. For <laughs> I mean, that's why I keep hammering down. I, I, I was it, trying obviously. to remember if he won. Did Im win there as well? Uh, Im did not. No, it's okay. I was trying to think. Im won Honda. Yeah, that's what, and, and he won Shriners. Tom Shriners. Kim also won Shriners. That's what I was. That's that's the one I was putting together. Okay, so but, one, one thing I was going to say though with that is or, sorry. Carry on your point first. I'm so, going to add one so more thing. So here's the one bad thing, and I can't remember when did the when did it switch over to March the players. 2019. Was it the year Rory won? I think it was 2019. So here's the problem with my thesis here. Rory, Thomas, Cam Smith, then are your winners in March. Elite players. Before that, if we go back to May, Webb Simpson, accuracy, putting, irons. Siwoo, accuracy in irons. Jason Day was the best player in the world at the time. He wins. What was Ricky doing? Ricky was hitting his irons and he was putting. Keimer, fairways, irons, putting. Tiger's Tiger. Matt Kuchar, fairways and irons. KJ Choi, fairways and irons. Tim Clark, fairways and <laughs> irons. Stenson, fairways and irons. Like, that is the path. How do you remember the Tim Clark stuff? 
how do I remember? Well, <laughs> it's like you were like Tim Clark, fairways and irons. Like you were, did you have his card or something? I know. Just he was, like, he was like he was always like he was basically like proto Brennan Todd. Okay, yeah, you got the memory for it. That's good. Okay, carry and, on. I mean, even that year, but is that a product of it being played in May? It maybe the course is laid out differently, or is that I would st- definitely put way more stock into that than your previous one of like figuring out the miscuts and the chalk and the sure. But I mean, stuff. But I that, that may agree. have no correlation anymore. And even to just go back and look at some of the guys in second, Furick, Furick. Kisner, Chapel, Poulter, uh, Charles, another one who kind of fits that mold. Zach Johnson, Ben Curtis, Robert Allenby, Davis Toms, Poulter. Like these are all guys that are short off the tee, hit a bunch of fairways, and are really good with their wedges. Yeah. I definitely don't think the off the tee stuff changed any. It just now becomes the other game that goes with it. Or are players better now? They're definitely better now. That's for sure, too. (laughs) (laughs) That matters. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess I agree with you, and that's where I was going with it. I, I definitely think the changes matter more than people may consider. But it's that's why I was saying, sometimes trying to put together a lineup of the elites and where I was going to go with it was Kitayama from last week. I believe his nickname is literally The Project. Like, that's what people call him, the, the funny video of Spieth. Hey, nice playing, Kurt. And then, like, it gives Tim Tucker better props than him after he choked away three, four-footer, five-footer under putts to have his shot at winning the event. But Kitayama is a guy that people have been monitoring. Like, he's going to be on the come up. He, fought, he was all the second places were to Rom, Rory, and Xander. And then he goes and wins the big boy event last week on top of those guys. And they were all in the mix. He had to go after a triple bogey, make seven pars, a birdie, and then almost hold it on the last sort of broke the place down on a crazy putt when you saw the view from behind, et cetera. But just saying, could you, when you go back in hindsight, it's not results oriented as much as Kitayama at 6,800 variance there for sure. But talent play with the big boys, a breakout at some point, I could see it. If you find the guys like that in this type of field, and you round it out with that and then put five elites, it goes with what you're saying, and it's still solid for the upside and all of that as well. You just need to find who's that guy. Justin Su. At the bottom. It's Su. So there you go. So let's take out Siwoo. Let's take out Keegan. And let's take out Connors. We'll go back to Homa, Morikawa, Kim. We can go to Justin Su, who's at 6,600. And if you want to look, like, just in general, so that leaves us almost 8,000. That's a weird range. Because they're, let me talk about the the players who are just being overlooked from eight thousand dollars and above. We mentioned Rom at the very highest end, then at Xander. Those are two guys that just right. people aren't really going to all that much. Fino doesn't seem like he has any buzz whatsoever. Like he and Morikawa are going to be in that like eight to thirteen range, depending on how it shakes out. Other than that, no one's playing Spieth, no one's playing Cam Young, no one is playing Hideki. But then you have. Probably the guy that you want to go to, Fitzpatrick. Yeah, I bet Fitzpatrick. I got my nice closing line value, 40, 40 to 1 I got on $8,600, I bet you he's 7% owned. And then you land on 7300 bucks. And then, uh, see, but then now we're into this dead zone that I was I had alluded to before, and then we can kind of talk about it. The, someone on the millionaire winning, winning lineup is going to be one of these, like, 13 guys. We just yeah. have to figure out who it is. So it's here's the range. I, and I'll tell you the four that I like from in here. You're going, what, seven to 7,300? Well, you're, I'm just looking at where the ownership is kind of uh, congregating because Bradley, Fowler, Connors, Mitchell, and Hoagie are all above or right around 10% ownership. Right. So then you start with Seamus Power at 74, and these are all sub-5% guys, like 0 to 5%. Power, Harmon, Henley, Montgomery, Norin, Denny, Minwoo, Kucher, Straka, Pendrith, K.H. Lee, Andrew Putnam, Aaron Wise. Then you get to Ben Griffin, who's going to be around like 10%. So of those guys, Power, Kucher, Pendriff, and then there's the one that I think I'm just going to blindly play because it makes way too much sense. I bet him his first round leader. Nothing would point to him doing well this week outside that it's the fucking players and guys just randomly pop up. But this is his style, of course. He won fucking four months ago is Russell Henley. I like Henley. People love Henley at this course and these types of courses, and no one wants to play him. He's 70. He fits that lineup. I know. That's perfect. Wow. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was my roundabout way of concluding this lineup. Yeah, I was going to say, that's good. But I actually do like Henley. He's another one, too, when you go back to those courses and look at some of these positional tracks off the tee heritage where, he's been good at, Where too. does he have success? He won at Mayakoba. He plays well at RSN. He's won the Sony. He's won the Honda. These are all the same courses. Yeah. <laughs> One guy you said there that you were just hitting on it quickly as and going down the board before the dead zone thing. Why is it like nobody likes Fino? Usually we like Fino when he's cheap at these events. Maybe people don't consider him being cheap anymore, I guess. I don't, I don't know. He's not been playing bad, though, and he's been 
He's right. been playing. I bet him last week, and he was all right. What was he like twentieth? Is that's he's horrible. Yeah, he came twentieth. What 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 did he finish? Twenty fourth. Yeah, twenty fourth, twentieth, fourteenth, ninth, sixteenth, seventh win. That's what we're looking at here. A guy that never finishes worse than top twenty and hasn't gained fewer than three point one strokes on approach in any tournament in twenty twenty three. Actually, at the century, he was he came seventh, but like it wasn't a great week for him. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of ways to to flip it around here and just look at it. How much, so if, if I consider like let's say him and here here's what I do sometimes, Pat though like Finau and Homa, both had their wins like on their runs. Like Homa's yes doing better maybe now slightly and and Finau's a little past it, but really is he twentieth or better? Twenty yeah. fourth or better in this run that saves you seven hundred bucks, and now you can still keep like Morikawa in there. You can keep Tom Kim, or you can take Tom Kim up to Will Zalatoris. That is the name I want to talk about. Yeah. Because you mentioned all these guys. I said, could I see Corey Connors winning a player's championship? Could I see Max Homa winning a player's championship? If we get to this tournament next year and Will Zalatoris is $11,000, is that going to surprise you? No. And everyone's just worried about the injury, but we weren't worried about it last week after the fourth. We're like, the injury is all good. He's back. It's a rough week. He's not back now. You know, it I mean, what, like... I mean, was he not back? He did exactly what Will Zalatoris does in the weeks where he misses the cut. It's exactly what happened to him last week. Yeah, it's but not. He... It's not like he drove them all into the water. But what he, he cruised he... through. He just shot seventy twos and seventy threes. He he lost. He gained. He gained almost five. Yeah, he he gained five strokes off the tee. He gained a stroke on approach. Couldn't chip. Couldn't putt. Yeah, shit happens. So you made like a really. This is why I look at these lineups. Like again, it doesn't project the best, but it's actually not that far behind. It's all, all right. But you made a really good case for Henley. Being able to grind a cut out here, and he's not probably the winner, but honestly, if he was in the top 10, it would not surprise me. Yeah, if, if you get a T9 Henley at 1.7%, like that, looking back at the past years of the guys that pop up in these winning lineups, it's that kind of like the $7,200 guy who you know is good. Brian Harmon that year. Mm-hmm. No one wanted to use Brian Harmon, but you, you could go back to Brian Harmon this year if you wanted to. We all loved Brian Harmon six weeks ago. Now he fucking sucks and no one wants to use him. Yeah, bad week last week, and this is he just goes and gets more practice in at Sawgrass, and now he comes out this week. I like the Henley call, but just for the upside a little bit more, but I do think, because like I said, but here's my point. Him, Fitzpatrick, being in the top 10 in the mix, like Fitzpatrick's even now longer off the tee, still straight, good all-around game. I know the injury scare with him, people worried about his neck and stuff, but it seems like he's okay. Zalatoris, same thing. I mean, literally, you know Zalatoris could win this. He's already got two top 25s or something, 26th and 21st, I believe, the last two years. Kawa. We already talked about him. Finau, we just talked about him being your Max Homa. Would you rather Homa? Sure, but for 700 bucks, go to Finau. It's fine. And then that leaves you Justin So, who if you believe he's the guy that could be and 8K you, in this field next year, or 7,500, which and, he could. And you can interchange that name with whoever the hell you want from down at the bottom. So I, I put out that list again. And even if you can go up or down a little bit, uh, Webb, Vegas, Aaron Rye, Davis Thompson, So, Sven, like if you want to use Svensson instead of Sfa, So, I think So's a better player, but... Svensson could be really good here. These are again, this is a type of course where Svensson has a great track record of playing well. I like I like Jaeger too. I always talk about him, right? He was first in his hey. class coming out like this. Bobby Shelton is a good player. Good player for sure. And then that lets you decide on like a Fitzpatrick to a Spieth or a Zalatoris to a Hovland if you do something like that in the same build where you can consider other guys. Did you have any love for, it feels like the other dead zone. I guess like we, we, now that we talked about middle eights, Zalatoris was like your Spieth, Zalatoris, Hovland, M, Finau kind of gets overlooked. Like, what do you think about those five guys there? Besides what you mentioned with, with uh, Fitzpatrick already. So I did just build this I, Finau or Morikawa, Finau, Zalatoris, Fitz, Henley, Suh. That's, that's what I had. That's yeah. awesome. So that's, that's a lineup that you can go with, I suppose. Dietrich is another one that I wanted to kind of shout out because I went back to him last week. He's actually pretty good. Mm. I mean, when you don't five putt from three feet, turns out you can like, play well in tournaments. <laughs> but he is another guy that I could see being a lot better. Like, is Matt Kuchar really going to be 9,900 next year? No. Right. But that, you like this way of looking at it, right? Like, that's what I try and explain yeah. to people. No, no, like, no I, I, I really like that. Like, who, are, who do you want to buy low on right now? It's a kind of a way to do it, even though we're playing, uh, this is a weekly game. I know it's daily fantasy, but you're playing for this classic slate for this particular week. But if you think about it like that, that's how you find a guy like Kitayama last week, because you know there's going to be variance with it, with playing him, but you also know what that upside is and what the potential of his future is. We could see that with guys like this, and there's a lot of them. You could name a bunch of different guys down there. I just wanted to start it for this exercise, and it kind of builds some good lineups. Do you like Hovland or Zalatoris better? Hmm. Zal, pro- probably Zalatoris. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I do too. But I think I, I think I like Zalatoris better. Will you use Spieth? Probably not. I I, I'm, I don't know officially yet, but I would. 
If I do, he'll be way underweight to the field because if he's 10%, he might fit into some. But I don't think he's going to be 10%. You don't? People are worried about this back injury. Yeah. And I don't even know if that's real or not. <laughs> yeah, no, no one has asked him about it. It's sort of like Fowler. I came into the week thinking Fowler was going to be uber chalk, and he's not. Should we yeah, just play Ricky? You can worry less about that, I think, besides the main guys because we know who the, the key culprits would be. Sure, but like, let, what are the chances in a two-to-one situation is what we're looking at right now, Keegan versus Fowler? How often does Bradley beat Fowler in this tournament? I don't have it at two-to-one. But, uh, yeah, that's that's a good argument to make, but it's play the guy you like. They're, they're pretty— Sure, but it's just funny that everyone is— Sorry, so, well, I guess I'll say it better that, that way. That one is more of a comparison because, obviously, Bradley is extremely high-owned. So you're comparing like the chalk versus the the guys that are just in that secondary range around him. I'm just saying when people are doing it at other areas, like a Keith, like a Corey Connors versus Keith, Keith Mitchell, they're both like 13 to 15 percent. If you like one of them, just play them and pick your guy. Like it, it matters way less there than it does deciding on the other factors. Now, if you're talking about Brian Harmon and Corey Connors, now you got a decision to make. But on, on paper, it looks like it's Connors. But like you said, I, would I it like surprise Connors. you if it's Harmon? No. No. But and he's way less owned, so that's where it becomes the. If you want to just play the lower owned guy, do it that way. But for your Keegan example, yeah, you could just play Ricky instead. I, I like Ricky this week. Siwoo too, right there. Oh yeah, of course. Yes, to play Siwoo. But then you have this other like. I think Burns is super interesting. I forgot he was winning this tournament midway through round three last year. Yeah. No one uh, really wants to play him, I guess. And I bet him it's seventy. Too big of a number for me. I mean, I did that last week, and he was like plus twenty. He- heating up. You know, like, don't you think he plays well this week and then everyone hops back on for Valspar and he finally has a down year there? Maybe. Coming off back-to-back championships at the Valspar, so I, I don't know. I'm playing Lowry and I'm playing Kirk as well, along with Tom Kim, like, just as a part of the mix. Obviously, I'm playing Tom Kim more than those guys. Yeah. But I like, I mean, I just like, I think safe is such a definitely no-no no word for this tournament, but Kirk feels like he's in great form. His skill set matches what this course demands. I don't like I said. I don't think he's gonna win, but yeah. Like, T- but people T6. are saying like he just won, and same with uh, Justin Rose. I've heard brought up too because he I just won. I don't like, like Rose as much. Yeah, I, I don't either. I actually like Scott probably more than Rose. If I'm playing like the old dude there, I'm not playing either of them. Will you play Maverick McNeely? No. Okay. I, I don't care. I don't. I'm I'm a Mav guy even, but I usually like him on the West Coast swing, on Poa, things like that. You know, coastal. Uh, it just depends on the setup you could compare, but I, I don't really like him to hear for this spot. And I, there's all kinds of guys in that range that I can go to. Kitayama? Yeah, that's one that's interesting. So he actually went up $100 yeah. from last week off the win, but it's not really going anywhere because you're still in the 6K range. I don't mind riding it again. He could just be that guy, and he looks like he's going to come in at like 5%. But yeah, or get, less. Yeah, he's definitely worth playing for, for sure at 6900 I, I was surprised. I mean, I get it. He just won. And I do like him at longer tracks, weirdly enough, rather than shorter tracks. Uh, but he had a pretty good run at Pebble earlier this year, too. So maybe he's just a very good player. I was surprised Harris English at 7,000 wasn't projecting higher owned. I figured after last week, people would be like, oh, Harris English. That's cheap. I'll play him. Yeah, I don't think I'll be playing him. Okay. Alex Smalley was one that I liked. Not really interested in him here either. One guy I liked, you brought it up earlier, the uh, the Wyndham comparison. I'll play a little JT Poston. Oh, yeah, I got Poston. 7,000. He's got the Wyndham stuff with him. He, he was bogey-free to win that tournament. Uh, he was, and he's another guy that's played well at the RBC Heritage. And played well at this tournament. And two, at this two, very tournament. Two top 25s and three starts. And yet the ownership doesn't reflect that. You know, it's because he's JT Poston. Correct. We, but we, we, all, we all played him at Honda, and he missed every two-foot putt there was. He can be your last guy into your lineup is all I'm saying. So that's, you know, if you do whatever you want with it. But I, I think he's interesting. Um, yeah, it just this bottom of the eights, mid, middle eights to bottom eights, I just find confounding. Who's the other guy uh, that surprised me? Wyndham Clark? Windy C? Yo, he was in the mix last week. Yeah, he's been good this Somewhat. Year. He's another guy that, again, could I see being more expensive next year? Yes. And then on top of it, when you went back and looked at some of those positional courses, he actually still showed up there. Everyone just sees him as the bomber, Wyndham Clark or whatever. Like, he, he can just bomb it out there, and we'll see what he does. Huge variance, et cetera. Sure. But he actually shows up in some of those metrics, so I thought that was interesting at 7,100. Again, going to the dead zone, I'm going to play more guys down here than most probably because he takes out TPC Lee. Everyone talks about him with these TPC tracks. Yeah, but now no one wants him. Now no one wants him. 7,200. Again, doesn't mean he's going to come through because of that. Just, again, a guy, uh, a good heritage history as well. Going back to talking about placement off the tee, all that stuff, I, I think he shows up there. So there actually is guys in the dead zone that you coined, and I think it's true, that actually still look like good plays. And we talked about Henley already. What about Taylor Montgomery? 
7,300. Is, isn't he a guy you could see be more next year? Oh, yeah, for sure. At this tournament? For sure. It's a risk, but I'm saying so are a lot of these other guys. Alex Noren. Can mm. he grind it out here? He's got I, his course history here is before the changes, yeah. but it was good. I, I Listen, I don't think that Alex Noren's ever going to be any of This is going to be his price in perpetuity, no matter what he does. He's just going to be this range. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's he's more of like a comparison of, you know, you're looking at the Harmons, the Coochers, the Coochers, those guys. Do you want to take him and risk it and see? Well, how much is Putnam? He played decent last week. He too. did play. He did play pretty decent last up and week. down. I think Se- on Sunday seventy two hundred dollars. But again, this is more his skill set: yeah. fairways, irons, putting. He didn't pop for me as much as the other guys in that range. But yeah, he did have a decent. He did really well last week. Uh, when I did the research show. Mm-hmm. I put in Wiley, Wiley, Wyndham, Heritage, Colonial, and one of the other ones, mm-hmm. the short ones. And he was one of just Shane Lowry was like the best, and Siwoo was up there as well at those tournaments. And then it was like Andrew Putnam. I'll take note of that because yeah, that, that's what I was looking at. Some stuff Harman too. I, was I must one. have missed him. Harmon definitely popped in, and I saw and I looked at something similar as you. And then the Lowry thing, I was just going to check again too. Man, they, what do you think about his price? I like Lowry. I'm, I'm playing Lowry. I wrote him up this week in my column. Like I just again, he's he's Mister Pete Die, and he has a good track record <laughs> this course. Ball strikers have a good track record at the players overall. Like, shitty putting, good ball strikers, they don't necessarily win, but they make the cut I think he's got decent history here, too. Yeah, he does. So does Fleetwood, but I don't want to play Fleetwood. I played him last week. That was no fun. Yeah. They're they're similar to me, and they're both coming in, what, like 10% ownership? Tommy does strike me as a guy with the Players' Championship to his name. Like he'll have one win ever in the U.S. and it'll be the Players. Yeah, we talk, we've talked about that in the past, too, for sure. And he's 100 bucks less than Jason Daychalk. I mean, I might just not play Jason Day. How about that? You That was the first guy you wanted to poke holes in, so usually your gut is, is right. I mean, the first lineup that I built this week has Jason Day in it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like before he's, a, he's a very obvious play at his price point. Yeah, it's 8K. <laughs> Him and Keegan, like I said, just that's why it just fits so easily. I can see how people can get, you know, with Cantlay, you can make more decisions because there's other guys around him that you think are the exact same and studs and all that. Most people looking at Day and Keegan are saying, man, I get that the other guys are there, but why don't I just play these other guys? And, you know, why don't I just play them and make it safe? So I see them getting a lot of ownership, especially the higher the stakes we go. Well, I do think that the best way you can get yourself – cash this week is by playing in the Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League because it's rake free, yes. thus making it the best tournament on DraftKings. But that might not actually be the easiest way for cash. The easiest way is probably retweeting the tidbits at Toe Tag and Tambo and following at Toe Tag and Tambo on Twitter and getting yourself in a draw for 500 bucks. I think that's the easiest way to make money. I mean, I mean sure. I'm going free. to, I'm going to do, I've already done both things. So I'm in the draw. That might be my only path to profitability. Rigged. Week. No, I won't let Pat win. Don't worry, guys. So he, he's out. All right. I think that's it. Do you got anything else? No, I'm excited for this week. It's going to be a big one. L- lots of money on the line. Two, uh, two Millie Makers, the big mega I won some tickets to last week. So I got a few in there for the 22-22. They got the $25 Millie Maker. Uh, trying to run the, I don't know if anyone's ever done, the double. The double Millie Maker the same weekend. Win the, the Millie at the NBA Live Final on Saturday night. Three entries in that. So hopefully three and a 100 shot. And then on Sunday, have a sweat in the players and get the job done there. What's it like having a 3% chance theoretically to win a million bucks? Most people in their life will never have that opportunity. Feels pretty good. Yeah, I think that was, a, you know, someone asked me about the New Orleans when, when I went there for the Fantasy Football World Championship. Was there any takeaways? You asked me, like, that's a 200-person field. I on, I don't think I did this to a full extent, but I definitely think, like, the I've never made it to that one versus, like, at King of the Beach, I've had so much success at. I got a second, a third. I came sixth again this year. I was coming in off that feeling good, playing the same way. I only had the one lineup out of the 200. So I said, like, the process that brought me here, I got to stick with. But then you saw like someone with five entries had a game stack for Dallas Jacksonville that nobody was really on except those that had the multiple entries. So one of the players was chalk. That that was the the week I won 10K with that stack. Yeah, which it made sense. In GPPs and stuff, we were playing them. When I had my one entry, I didn't stick that. So the takeaway was that like, again, it's not easier, easier said than done, but get some more entries so that you can cover some more angles and then you can at least play off each other. So my goal was two. The whole time for this, once I got the first, I was like, I just want to get a second entry so I can try and beat what I you know, ran into last time where if my best lineup was my best, I win. Awesome, or have a good shot. But if I don't, I'm kind of out of it. Here, now with three, I can play sort of an angle of like, let's stick to my process lineup. What does the field do? Got, trying to leverage against that. Maybe a game stack in the third. Like there's different angles I can approach. I'm not sure what I'll do yet. Haven't got to that point, but we know the slate. There's no late swap. They shorten the slate to like eight games. It's a pretty good opportunity for sure. 
I like it. Good luck. Thank you. So I'll, I'll see you next Wednesday, but you're going to be there this weekend, so you're not going to be on the Cut Sweat Show. That's right. This week, I'll miss the Cut Sweat Show. For the majors, should be all good. Cut Sweat, we're, we're, I'm going to... Let's do it live. We'll come over here and meet yeah, at least me and you. I'm uh, trying to uh, rig up the camera for inside the studio house yeah. with all the TVs on the wall so we can watch all the feeds at once. It's the best. It's like barstool style. People love it. It's so good. And your room is set up perfect for it. Those people saw pictures and stuff on your Twitter, but it's like all the TVs on the wall. The couches are there. You set the set the cameras up and we can just shoot the shit. And if it's live and feeding out, that'd be awesome. And then I'm going to order custom uh, Big Mac chickens. Let's do it. Have a challenge. Might, might do that. Or we're going live on uh, Sunday night as well for March Madness. You got some good friends that come over here too that we could have some challenges. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know if we or... can put them on a live feed, man. Why? E- e- eating contest too? Like just something fun. There, there are a couple people I don't think are, are made for... <laughs> Especially when they forget that there's cameras on and there's microphones on them. <laughs> That's like, what I'm thinking. The, the Mayo Media Network might get shut down. Canceled. Yeah. yeah. Like immediately and for good reason. Yeah. So we might not do with, that. With some of these friends. You have to that like have give them a, a waiver first to sign. Yeah. All right. At Toe Tag and Tambo on Twitter, playing the Listeners League, fantasynational.com slash Mayo to generate these lineups. That's what I've been using. You can build your own model. Check out all of the shows. Rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That also gets you into the draw for that extra $500 as well. And shout out again to whoever the fuck that I said one, the Paz Man. Is that the guy's name? He'll know his name. He's yeah. coming for his 500 bucks. I'll have to watch it back now that I, I have to go like DM him on Twitter to make sure that he gets his $500. Either way, there's another $500 to go around. So the rating and review, sub to the channel, smash the like, and follow Tambo on Twitter at ToeTag and Tambo and retweet that, those tidbits, which you can find in the newsletter as well. Thank you all for watching. Good luck this week. Someone bring home the million, all right? We'll see you next time. Family experience. Experience!